We are less than one week away from the Major League Baseball draft, and the Orioles, well, they've been pretty good, so they're picking a little lower than usual. The question is, how do the O's approach this draft at pick number 22 and beyond? We'll have MLB draft expert Joe Doyle on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles. Your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So our guest today is Joe Doyle. He is from Future Star Series. He covers the MLB draft basically from every angle you can possibly imagine. He's been on this podcast many times before, is basically our draft consultant at this point. And Joe, thank you so much for jumping back on the podcast. Draft consultant. That's not a uh, not a title that I've held, but I will welcome it, Connor, and, and happy to be here, dude. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think. I think 2020, we've even had you back as far as then when the Orioles made the Heston Kerstad pick and a lot of people were confused. And now he's hitting in the middle of their order um, as they go for uh, another AL East title. And, and that is what they're going to look for this year. The problem is they are no longer picking in the top five. And that is where we start here. The Orioles are down at number 22. This is the lowest they have picked in the Michael Elias era. Of course, they picked 17th last year and took Enrique Bradfield, and it was kind of a little bit of an off-the-board selection, not in player talent, just in that Enrique doesn't really fit where the Orioles have gone in terms of player profile. So kind of my first question is, the O's pick at 22. There's going to be talent there, but does picking down there versus in the top five kind of allow teams like the Orioles to maybe go in a little bit of a different direction. I'm not saying they're going to pick a high school pitcher or anything that's been way off Michael Elias's board, but just in a little bit of a different direction like we saw last year. You know, I, I think when you look at Baltimore, one thing will always reign true, and it's just follow the model and you'll probably find the pick. And by model, I mean, how can we get, and I know this sounds very cliche, and every team is probably trying to do this in one way, shape, or form, but how are we going to get the most value out of this pick. I love the Baltimore pick in 2023 because I too was very high on Enrique Bradfield Jr. I thought the bigger bases, I thought the uh, the, the greater need for stolen bases in Major League Baseball was going to become a really big thing. I don't remember where I had him uh, in, the, in that board. It was something like 14, 15. I had him pretty high because I think he's going to be able to provide value in other ways other than slugging, which is what they've always gone for. But listen, I think they're probably going to go along the same lines as what they've done in the past. They're going to look for guys that can uh, can contribute different traits, different metrics, different ways of applying value. On the offensive end, I still just have a, such a hard time believing that they would go pitching. So whether it's a speedster, whether or not, whether it's a, a complete slugger, whether or not it's a, it's a shot at one of these guys with huge strikeout issues, I think Baltimore could be one of the teams that just goes in a, a pretty unique direction here. Yeah, it's, it's certainly what happened last year. Now, I want to start with the guy in your most recent mock draft 6.0 over at Future Star Series. We can check it out and subscribe over there as well to see all of Joe's work. It's Carson Benji Bengi from Oklahoma State. Um, he plays mm -hmm. in a ballpark that um, breeds offense, as we, as we have seen in regionals over the past few years, but also a very talented outfielder. What kind of makes him... Uh, at least the guy you've slotted in at number 22 for the Orioles. And, and we know, uh, I'm sure we'll see some more mock drafts from you before it's all said and done, but he's the guy at the moment for you. Yeah, I'll put out one more on Friday. The what, What's that going to be? The 12th. Uh, and that'll be my last ditch effort at, at trying to trying to hit this thing. But, you know, at the end of the day, I look at Carson Benj and I look at a guy who has a ton of tools. It is a tremendous throwing arm in right field. It is borderline elite contact rates in a pretty good conference in college baseball. It's the ability, the proven ability to hit velocity. It's the proven ability to cover everything in the strike zone. I mean, a 92% in zone uh, contact rate. It's elite. It's elite. And then if you couple that with the fact that Carson Benj posted an average exit below over 93 miles an hour this year, he really checks a lot of the boxes and he can run. The thing with Benj, I think that is going to be so divisive and, and it's going to be interesting whether or not the Baltimore Orioles believe they can extract and, and make fully efficient is he hits the ball on the ground a lot. And it is a very loud, noisy swing that has a lot of moving parts. But, you know, if there was one team outside of maybe the Dodgers that I think could, you know, fully optimize a player with the tools that Carson Bench has, I think it would be, I think it would be the Baltimore Orioles. I mean, 
Heston Kerstad has has his swing has become noisier since he got to since he got to uh, to Baltimore, and they've really really calmed down Colton Kowser swing since he was at Sam Houston. So I think Carson Benj fits in a similar mold, and he might be a better athlete than both of those two in right field. That sounds pretty good to us, and the Orioles have quite an Oklahoma State pipeline. Uh, the, the Holiday family is a, is a huge part of that, now Jackson uh, being in the organization, and that would kind of continue that. As we talk more about just college bats, because that has been where the Orioles have gone in the first round, another guy that I have been in love with since watching a lot of him in college is Cam Smith. I am a gigantic cam smith fan but does he fall in or are there any a couple more college bats who could fall in who you see maybe being available at 22 that the the orioles could go to that do kind of fit that model that they've gone with since michael Elias took over yeah i mean cam smith i think would be the perfect fit for baltimore i just don't see any way for him to actually be there at 22 he, he's a name that gets brought up a lot with me um i'm just gonna throw a big ballpark not to give anything away like five to 17 like i think there's a lot of teams in that range that would be very very happy for florida state's third baseman to end up uh in their in their organization in terms of what he is i mean he, again it's like it's it's a metric monster like it's a right-handed third baseman who's going to play third base with with huge exit velos and tremendous feel for for uh, avoiding whiffs and anytime you're talking about a player like that and those players are a lot more rare than I think a lot of people give credit for. That's going to be a Baltimore Orioles type of a pick. Um, in terms of the guy that I really think people should be watching out for. Well, there's two, but on the college side, there's one. I think Ryan Waldschmidt out of Kentucky is a guy that could be there at 22. I, I've heard his name higher than that, but you know, six foot two, 200 pounds. He's been, uh, again, I, I talk about metrics. I talk about traits because I think it is the easiest predictor of who's going to go where teams have a type. And I think Ryan Waldschmidt, even though he's a right-handed hitting left fielder, which is an unconventional pick for Mike Elias and, and, and Matt blood and what those guys are doing over there in Baltimore, he's a plus runner. Um, it's borderline elite bat to ball skills. I know on their models, he's going to grade out very high because he's playing in the sec and he's done it for two years in a row in the sec. There's some exit below there. He's going to be able to provide some form of value on the field in just about every arena outside of his throwing arm in left field. So that would be the guy that I would watch for. And I think if, if Baltimore does end up with Ryan Waldschmidt or Carson Benj, I would rest easy knowing they have taken a guy that they probably believe they're going to be ex uh, going to be able to extract every ounce of their capabilities. We'll get back to our conversation with Joe Doyle in just a moment, but first this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by FanDuel. Listen, I love sports, but over the summer with the NBA and the NHL ending, there's not as much going on or so you think. But you still got Major League Baseball every single night, the WNBA, the Copa America. You've got the Euros. You've got the Olympics coming up. There's something to do every single night. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day all summer long. So head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer at FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. So I got a play to the masses up next, which is the question that every Baltimore Orioles fan will ask, when will the Orioles take a pitcher in the first round? And it hasn't been, it's been a combination of the Orioles have pitched so high and there's been so many great bats they've been able to go after. And also, you know, with Jackson Ballmeister being the highest pitcher they've ever taken when they took him uh, with a competitive balance pick after the second round last year, you know, maybe Michael Elias is creeping up a little bit and they took way more pitching, way more talented pitching in the draft last year. And there are obviously two names that I think even non-college baseball fans know because one's a switch pitcher that has a first round talent and the other throws well over a hundred and it is a first round talent. So is there any chance you see the Orioles? I mean, I am on the side of, listen, they have hit on pretty much every first round bat. So keep it coming. But do you see there being any chance that if, if the Orioles see one of those guys in that spot or another arm, this could be the first time that Elias goes first round arm. So here's my only thought process on that. One, if we're looking at things in a vacuum with no, you know, outlier variables in play, I don't see it. I mean, they, they've never done it. He didn't do it in Houston, which I think is incredibly important to look back on. He didn't do it in Houston either. This is not just a, 
you know, a four or five year sample with the Orioles. This is a career long sample with uh, with the with what they've done in in in, in uh, Houston. And the guys that they did take in Houston that they learned their lessons from were, did not turn out well, right? So I, I don't know whether or not Baltimore would ever call an audible and, and go in a different direction. Now, the only thing that I'm thinking, and I don't know if this has been brought up with, with Baltimore blogs. I apologize if it's just a repetitive narrative. If Baltimore is looking for another seventh or eighth inning guy this year, and they don't want to pay the freight at the trade deadline, could they go the Garrett Crochet route with Brody Brecht and say, this guy could pitch in the seventh inning for us right now. I mean, it's a hundred, it's a 91, 92 mile an hour slider. It's an 87 mile an hour curveball. If that guy is even close to the zone in big league ball, and he's willing to throw the breaking ball early and often, I mean, there's a very, very reasonable argument to say he should be in Baltimore in September. The biggest question though is after the 2024 season is over, how does Mike Elias feel about having a pitching prospect in his organization, knowing arguably full well, there was probably more value to be had with the 22nd pick. I think if it's going to be a pick, it's going to be Brody Brecht. I think he's got more immediate value down the stretch for a team looking for pitching to kind of get over that final world series hump. Jurangelo Sinche, he's more of a starting pitching prospect than he is impact immediately. I don't know if they would go that route. So that's the question that I think all Orioles fans should be asking. How compelled does Mike Elias feel that Brody Brecht could pitch in the seventh inning in October? And is it enough to make him, you know, take a shot on that type of a player right now? Otherwise, I, I just I don't I don't see them doing it. They never have, and I just don't think they ever will. And and all due respect to the White Sox, I mean, they brought up Crochet as a good reliever, and it's still now turned him into one of the best starters in the American League with a Tommy John surgery sure. in between. And to me, like, if the White Sox can do that, I do think the Orioles could do that as well down the road with Brett after they kind of got some usage out of him. But obviously, that's something they haven't even come close to doing, and it would kind of be, be out of left field for them as well. Now, the Orioles, they do also have the number 32 pick in this draft. Uh, from Gunnar Henderson going ahead and being up in the big leagues and winning Rookie of the Year last year. And it feels like that could be the place, because they've done this plenty of times, where maybe they could dip into the high school ranks at number 32 and, and maybe try and add a guy, maybe give a guy a little bit of an overslot bonus to get him to sign. Are, are there any high school players I would figure it would be a position player who would be available around number 32? I know you have Carter Johnson in there, a, a shortstop of out of Alabama in that spot in one of your mock drafts, but but him or any other guys who could be available that I mean, obviously every Orioles fan is looking for the next Gunnar Henderson in that spot. And it's hard to find another Gunnar Henderson, but anybody that could be close to that. Yeah. So I, I would point to if you're going to look at the high school side of things with Baltimore, I would look for an impact bat. And Carter Johnson is more hit over power and he's more second base over shortstop right now. I don't think that would necessarily stop Baltimore from taking him at 32. He's got a beautiful swing. He's been one of the more consistent hitters on the high school showcase and tournament circuit over the last calendar year, but he really didn't put on very much weight. He didn't add any bat speed. He didn't add any impact over the winter. And that's kind of pushed his profile down into that second round range. I look at what Baltimore has done with some of their high school picks over the last few years. And generally I I've seen that they take guys that play up the middle of the field and guys that have huge bat speed. So I would look at someone like a Wyatt Sanford. I don't know if he's going to be there. I have him at 21 on my board, but a guy like Wyatt Sanford, a guy like Tyson Lewis, those two have a little bit more size. They have a little bit more strength. They have an obvious bat speed right here, right now. They both project to stay on the dirt and play, uh, play on the field i would look at them and then if, if you think baltimore could kind of do something that they've never really done what about pj morlando i mean that's a first base prospect it's it's thump over everything i mean he's got a beautiful left-handed swing it, it might be the most usable game power in this draft right now now you are fully sacrificing the fact that hey pj morlando he's probably going to be the baltimore orioles first baseman in 2027 and beyond and that might be fine but that seems like the type of pick that would be more down the Mike Elias train of thought was like, hey, let's just let's take this high schooler who could be a 285 and 35 guy rather than this, even though he's a second baseman shortstop, who could be a 275 and 15 guy. I think that's the type of move that Mike Elias and those guys could could do that would be a little bit more interesting than what they've done in the past. 
So we'll finish up our conversation with Joe Doyle in just a moment. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by Prize Picks. For me, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. How do you, do you do it? Well, all you do is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. You can now win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. All you look into is maybe the WNBA or Major League Baseball on any night, the more or less on the point totals they give you for Caitlin Clark or Angel Reese, or maybe more or less on hits for guys like Adley Rutschman and Gunnar Henderson. So download the prize picks app today and use code locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. That's code locked on MLB on prize picks for a deposit match up to $100 at prize picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. And today's episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by Tax Network USA. Here at Locked On Orioles, we pride ourselves on getting you the latest news for your team, whether it's the offseason, the draft, spring training, or the playoffs, it's year round. And you know what else is year round? Collection season. Just because tax season is over doesn't mean the IRS will stop coming after you for unfiled taxes. The IRS can garnish your wages, levy your bank accounts, and even seize your property. So don't let the IRS target you. Let the licensed professionals and tax experts at Tax Network USA go to bat for you. With over 14 years of experience and an a rating by the Better Business Bureau, Tax Network USA has saved their clients over $1 billion in tax debt. Whether you owe taxes, have complicated matters that require tax planning, or you finally hit that parlay this season and need help correctly filing, call 1-800-549-1000 or visit tnusa.com slash locked on. And be sure to mention Locked On Orioles at checkout, and you'll receive a $250 discount off their services at Tax Network USA. Joe, I think the last thing I really have for you is just, you know, we've continued to do this year after year. The Orioles continue to crush the draft. It, for me, is what they've done best so far. And obviously, you got to develop these guys. And there's a lot of talk about, oh, the Orioles are just this good because they had the high draft picks. Like, yeah, it's a little bit of it, but you have to develop all these guys into impact big leaguers. And you look up and down their current lineup, and it is mostly guys who the Orioles have brought in high in the draft and developed and they started to turn another direction last year and that was because they picked lower they took much more pitching they took pitching a little bit higher they started to kind of restock their farm system with arms because it was probably the best farm system of bats just wanted to give you a chance like what your outlook your thoughts on the Orioles really since Mike Elias took over and and how they've built this thing not purely through the draft but you look at the star-studded talent and it's either Guys who they drafted, they're three all-stars, two guys they drafted with top picks and one guy they went and got in Corbin Burns because they traded two of their top picks who they didn't feel had a you know an everyday role on their team to go and get. I just wanted to give you kind of a, a chance here, like your thoughts on what Elias has done with this draft and, and, and what the Orioles will kind of continue to do moving forward because as they pick lower, and we hope that happens every single year from now on, it's going to get a little tougher to replenish all this talent in the system. Yeah, so this is where I'd start. The Baltimore Orioles may have picked high, but they've turned all of those players into their 90th percentile outcome or better. I mean, go look at the guys that were picked around some of the guys that the Orioles have picked. It's not just about the draft. It's about having a program, a development program in place to extract value, to, to provide clear messaging, to provide a trajectory and an avenue toward getting a player to become what they can become. And, and Baltimore has done that with like every single player that they've drafted. It's been, it's been amazing. In fact, I was having a conversation with someone last week and I said, what's going on with Matt Horvath? Like he's not really, he's not really, he's not really blowing everyone out of the water yet. It's like, that's an outlier, right? Like Matt Horvath is, was a, was a second or a third round pick. And he hasn't been this star immediately which you almost always just expect from baltimore but you look at jackson holiday you look at Cowser, you look at what they've done with kobe mayo who i had serious reservations about in the draft i mean all the physical tools in the world but a swing that was going to challenge whether or not he was going to be able to be a a full-time player at the big league level i had a ryan healy comp on kobe mayo and they've turned him on they've turned him into something that could go out and get just about any player that they want at the trade deadline, having Kobe Mayo. It, Enrique Bradfield Jr. has been solid. Heston Kerstad, despite all of the roadblocks, 
mm-hmm. has become a big leaguer and and a and a full time player in in short order. I'm I'm sure. So I, I just I look at what this team has been able to accomplish by not only picking the right players but turning them into what they're supposed to be, turning them into what they can become. And I think that should be the narrative. I don't think this is a story about, um, you know, crashing and, and burning and, and you know, being the worst team in the, in the league for three years to get the number one pick. No, I mean, they've done really well in later rounds, too. So uh, I give all of the all the credit in the world to Mike Elias. I've had him on my podcast a couple of times. He's a very, very nice guy. And all the I've had Matt Blood on my podcast, too. He's a nice guy. And you know, Brad Selick was wonderful when he was in Baltimore. They just have the right people in place, it seems, all the time. And uh, so long as they continue the clear messaging and the development program that they have in place, I don't know if they can make a wrong pick. You know, we look at this year's draft. I don't think these will be Baltimore Orioles, but Vance Honeycutt, every tool in the world except for a hit tool. Dakota Jordan, every tool in the world except a hit tool. If they ended up at Baltimore, I would be buying so high on those two to become, you know, big league regulars. And I think that speaks volume to speaks volumes to what Baltimore has been able to accomplish. So I'm a huge fan of the organization. I'm a huge fan of the front office, and uh, they really do things the right way. And they did it last year with Bradfield. It's you know there there is a certainly a, a tool missing there, and uh, you feel like if anybody can do it, because it's like hey, his floor is still super super high with what he brings. And uh, if you're asking one team to get the most out of him, it could be the Orioles. And and you were talking about you know still having to develop those guys, still having to make the right picks, even with those top picks. Mm-hmm. The other day, the Orioles were in Seattle and Jim Palmer was on the broadcast and I think he was just reading off the 10 players drafted before Gunnar Henderson. And it was like, you know, three or four guys who've had a cup of coffee and some guys who haven't even been in the big leagues yet. And it's like every team had a chance to get him. The Orioles gave him the money he wanted and then developed him into who the guy who might win the MVP in his second full season in the big league. So they've certainly done a great job there. And the hope is that even now picking as low as they have at number 22, uh, they can find another great talent in this draft. Joe, thank you so much again for joining me on the show. Uh, let everybody know where they can find all of your work, all of your content, all of your rankings, write-ups, everything uh, as we sit just a few days from the 2024 MLB draft. Yep. So Wednesday, July 10th, you can find the top 615 prospects with full scouting reports over at futurestarseries.com. And then, you know, if you're really into the draft, and this is definitely your cup of tea, uh, you can find my weekly podcast on the draft and rumors, whispers, and team previews over at patreon.com slash overslot. So our thanks so much to Joe Doyle. That'll do it for today's episode. We'll be back tomorrow talking a little baseball, Orioles, and Cubs. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day.